Um, if I stand here, then I can walk around and wave my arms around. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I shall shout. Thank you very much. It's nice to be here. Um, I did my specialist training here in Oxford, so it's nice to be back, so I know Oxford really well. Um, yes, I'm going to talk about uh, trauma, child abuse and addictions, and I'm going to talk about MDMA, and I'll talk about some of the other psychedelics as well. And it's a really exciting subject for me because I, I truly see us at the brink of a revolution in the way we do psychiatry. Um, old psychiatry has been failing our population of patients for too long. Those of you who work clinically will recognize this. We are tied down by maintenance therapies that are not treating our patients in the way they deserve to be treated. We have to seriously tackle the pharma-led industry that drives psychiatric prescribing, and in my opinion, we have to tackle the whole concept of categorical diagnoses, which just do not fit our patients. And 20 years as a psychiatrist, um, psychedelic medicines are, in my opinion, the most exciting new psychopharmacology to come out of the last hundred years or so. So um, watch this space for the massive impact that psychedelics are going to be having in the future of medicine and, and culture and society. So I want to start with that picture. I'll let you read it. So. We hear a lot about public health messages around things like smoking and diabetes and obesity and how all these things are linked. It's quite staggering how we fail to recognize this very, very simple fact, um, that the developmental trajectory from child abuse and maltreatment into adult mental disorders and particularly addictions has one of the strongest effect sizes in psychiatry. It's so obvious, if you hurt a child, you'll damage an adult. Yet we forget this because Let's imagine that isn't a scared, frightened, bruised, humiliated, lonely 10-year-old girl. Let's imagine that she's 40 and she's sitting by the bus stop and she wants you to give her a quid. And she's HIV positive and she's hepatitis C positive and she's a IV heroin user and she's alcoholic. Don't give her a quid. It's her fault. She did this. It's a lifestyle choice. She could stop if she wanted to. If you give her money, she'll just spend it on booze or drugs. Now that's outrageous. It's outrageous, it's disgusting in two ways. Firstly, we should be compassionate towards all people, no matter what they've done to get where they are. We should treat people with respect and compassion. But secondly, when we fail to recognize this developmental trajectory, we are failing to recognize some very simple signs. It's so obvious scientifically that this trajectory takes place and we forget this. We switch off our, our empathy and we demonize these people. They become scum, public enemy. It's their fault. And we have to tackle this at every possible opportunity. So when we think about child abuse, most people, are, when they think of the words child abuse, they think of the biggies, what we might call big T trauma physical abuse and sexual abuse, the stuff that hits the sort of social services radar. But I urge you not to take your eye off the ball with emotional abuse and neglect. I don't love you. Your dad doesn't love you either. We didn't want a boy, we wanted a girl. You're unlovable. Mummy, look at my picture, that's crap. That drip, 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 emotional abuse, that undermining, has a profound effect on the development of human psyche, a profound effect on how we live our lives and how we see ourselves and how we see the world. So, Charles Cartridge bang on about two things. One, attachment. Two, boundary. Very important concepts in, in all psychiatry, but particularly child and adolescent psychiatry. Um, and this attachment relationship is really quite beautiful. It's wonderful to watch, and working with children and families is a real privilege. The attachment relationship becomes this blueprint by which we measure the rest of our mental lives. The core concepts of what is love, what is trust, what is friendship, what, what is a parent, what is a sibling. Is it okay to screw people over? Is it okay to lie and to cheat and to manipulate? Is it okay to drop litter? These things you learn when you're that high, and you don't really lose it. You keep those for life. 
Um, the other big, big factor in uh, mental disorders in adulthood are all these psychosocial factors there on the right. And those of you who work in mental health will recognize that we work with patients on the bottom rung of the ladder. We work with patients who not only have poor attachment and poor parenting in a history of trauma, but people who have transgenerational unemployment, poverty, racism, exclusion, lack of hope, poor education. And it's multiple factors that all stack up like this. Um, for all, all, me all medical conditions, but particularly psychiatric <coughs> conditions, most of the patients we work with in psychiatry have two, three, four, five risk factors all impacting together, plus genetics as well. And the thing about genetics is they're not evenly spread across society. All the people who live in the poor part of town with the poor education and the poor attachment and the abuse and the substance misuse and the criminality, that's where depression, anxiety, personality disorders, psychosis, addictions, genes cluster. So if we were going to practice eugenics, we'd get all the nice people from the posh schools at the top of the hill to mate with all the others and then we could spread the genes around. Obviously we're not going to do that. So we work with multiple risk factors in psychiatry. Now, um, a little bit of a neurophysiology lesson for you. So, that area in red is the amygdala. Now, um, the amygdala is part of the limbic system. Um, all mammals have an amygdala. It's uh, reasonably sophisticated. I mean, if you're a, if you're a cockroach, you, you've just got the lower part of the brain. You've got like the brain stem, so you've got like blood pressure, heart rate, chemical composition of blood, temperature, those kinds of things. Go a bit higher up the evolutionary scale, and we have this bit in the middle, this red area, called the um, amygdala, and this is part of the limbic system. And this is the part of the brain that responds to fear. And this is what we call a bottom-up reaction. It's a knee-jerk reaction. No higher centres are involved in that. Um, it's instinctive. So someone comes running into the lecture theatre with a knife, your amygdala fires. I'm in danger. And it, and it triggers a hormonal response called fight, flight, freeze, which you've probably heard of. And this is a hormonal response that uh, readies you to deal with this fearful stimulus. So if you are able, you'll stand and fight. If you're further down the fear level, you will run away, slightly less sophisticated. And if you're even more frightened, you'll just freeze, fight, flight, freeze. No higher centres are involved. It keeps you alive. It's a neuroadaptive response. The little area there in the green is the prefrontal cortex. Now, the prefrontal cortex is a much more sophisticated part of the brain. This is the human part of the brain. If you look at um, brains of mammals, most brains of mammals stop where the red bit is there. This wobbly part of the brain with the sulky and gyri on top, that's a human thing. No other animals really have that to much extent. That's where we have all our human capacities, and particularly the frontal, the prefrontal cortex, where we <coughs> use rationality, judgment, and reason. And we can overcome that instinctive amygdala response with our prefrontal response. So these two areas are in communication with one another. So the guy comes into the lecture theatre with the knife. Your amygdala says, get out, you're in danger. Fraction of a second later, prefrontal cortex kicks in, and you say, well, he looks okay, I can, I can reason with him, he's a smiley kind of guy, and he's wearing a chef's hat, so, you know. <laughs> so you overcome this instinctive, bottom-up, knee-jerk reaction to fear with a top-down, conscious reaction, which is much more human. Now, if you are a child growing up in an environment where when your caregiver comes into the room every day, you don't know if you're going to be kissed and cuddled and they're going to sit on the floor and do a jigsaw with you, or are they going to kick you, or punch you, or burn you with a cigarette, or are they going to rape you? Now, if you grow up in that kind of environment, you develop physical brain changes. The brain changes physically in terms of network development and growth within that, those parts of the brain. You develop a hyper-amygdala response. You become attuned to fear, and you see fear far more than other people who are not in that environment. And you have an attenuated or shrunken prefrontal response. That green area doesn't grow as much. There's no advantage in seeing the good in people. There's no advantage in reasoning that maybe I'll be okay. So you grow with these physical brain changes according to that 
attachment relationship and that environment in which you um, are born. And the result of this is identity formation. So with an insecure attachment in that noxious environment, you develop these narratives about yourself and the world. I am useless. I am a failure. I am unlovable. I am a slut. I deserve to be raped. It's my fault. And you follow pathways that take you into exploitative relationships. And you develop narratives about the world. No one is to be trusted. Everyone is dangerous. If someone says they love me, they don't really. Get the boot in first. They're trying to trick me. So these become very fixed and very rigid and very difficult to shape. Now, I often ask my patients in my clinic in Western Supermare to look out of the window and say, what do you see as people walk down the street? And they'll, they'll look out and they'll go, he looks dodgy, she looks dodgy, I wouldn't trust him, she'd rip me off. And I say, it's weird, because I look out the window and I say, he looks really nice, I bet she'd be my friend. I could trust her. So there is no objective reality. We are all the products of these narratives that form very early in life according to our experiences. Now, it is so overwhelmingly distressing to live with these kinds of narratives that the best option is just to block out the world with dangerous drugs such as heroin and more dangerous drugs such as alcohol. Drugs that blunt the edges, drugs that stop you feeling anything at all because your feelings are so overwhelming. Now, it's very hard to treat childhood trauma like this. It's very difficult to treat these rigid narratives. It's like, sometimes I just want to shake my patients and say, you are not a useless, worthless piece of crap. You are a good person. You are an erudite, intelligent, attractive person. You could do well. But it doesn't, it's not that simple. It's like someone telling me, and I've had a good attachment, Actually, Ben, you're, you're a horrible, mean, evil bastard and everyone hates you and you can't trust people. I wouldn't believe them because that's not my experience. So it's very hard to treat these things in patients. So how do we treat them? Well, we have polypharmacy. We have drug patients on multiple drugs. And the reason they're on multiple drugs is because none of the drugs actually cure the patient. They don't treat the root cause, the trauma. They treat the symptoms. So an illness such as PTSD, there is no single drug that cures PTSD. We treat the symptoms. If they're depressed, give them an antidepressant. If they can't sleep, give them a hypnotic. If their mood goes up and down, give them a mood stabilizer. If they're hypervigilance, that edginess that comes with trauma withdrawal, becomes paranoid, give them an antipsychotic. So they're on all these different drugs that treat the overlying symptoms of the disorder, none of which are treating the actual trauma itself. And a good analogy I would use here is if you have an infection due to a microorganism, a bug, um, you could take paracetamol or ibuprofen because one of the symptoms of an infection is a fever, a high temperature. Now, you take paracetamol and ibuprofen, why not? It'll bring your temperature down a bit better and you'll feel a bit better. But ibuprofen and paracetamol are not antibiotics. They're not gonna kill the microorganism, the bug that's causing the infection. That's, you're just treating one of the overlying symptoms. And this is what we do when we give patients SSRIs and all these other daily maintenance drugs. We're not curing them, we're just treating their high temperature and they have to keep on taking these drugs day in, day out, weeks, months, years, decades, to keep the symptoms at bay. This is not good enough after 100 years of modern psychiatry. It's not good enough. We could be doing better than this. Now, so we have polypharmacy. Polypsychotherapies. Now, if there's any psychologists in the room, they may disagree with me on this, but 20 years in psychiatry and a lot of psychotherapy experience in my opinion, the most important thing about psychotherapy is affecting a positive relationship. There's many models to treat trauma. You've got CBT, trauma-focused psychotherapy, exposure therapy, DBT, EMDR, IPT, CAT, you name it. Loads of different psychological models. But what they all seem to have in common is basically affecting this positive relationship and then saying, tell me about your pain. Tell me about your rape. And for so many patients, 50% of patients, this is just not possible. They can't even think about the idea of thinking about their rape. 
And the moment they try and go there to that psychotherapy and work on that issue, they're out the door and they're back to their bottle of vodka because it's just too overwhelming. And the result is 50% of patients with trauma-based disorders become lifelong chronic disorders with maintenance therapies holding back the symptoms and not getting to the root cause. And of course the pharma industry queue up to give us these, these uh, maintenance products. So I'm very interested in alcohol and um, it's extraordinary that we have, you're only allowed three mental states okay, in this country, three mental states, waking, sleeping and drunkenness. <laughs> yeah? There is, our brains are capable of a vast array of different mental states, many of which are really, really quite pleasant, beneficial, provide personal and community cohesion and de development and growth, and for many people are far preferable to alcohol. We're not allowed those, just allowed alcohol. And we are sitting on a serious problem here in the UK um, regarding alcohol. In fact, I heard today on the radio, alcoholic liver, dis um, alcoholic liver cancer is hugely increasing and is becoming a bit of an epidemic. We're losing the battle in this country to alcohol. It's endemic, you know? I mean, the students, you know this, you walk down the high street on a Saturday night and it's like quadruples for a quid. You hear it on breakfast TV, you know, what are you doing tonight? I'm gonna get pissed. It's just there in our culture and it's normal. And you, have, you don't have to go far out of this country to look back in and realize just how bad this is in this country. I'm, I, I equate it to the National Rifle Association in the idea that there is a very strong political financial lobby for the drinks industry in the UK. And it's hampering progress at tackling the alcohol problem. So how well are we doing to manage alcohol use disorder in the UK? Well, after the very best that the medical profession can throw at you, so like a, a Librium detox, rehab, anti-craving drugs, MAP groups, AA, individual psychotherapy, group psychotherapy, the very best we can throw at our patients. About 80 to 90% of people are drinking again within three years. Um, and it's actually about 75% are drinking again within nine months of a detox. <coughs> this is awful. This is rubbish. We were doing better at treating alcoholism in the Victorian times than we are today. It's a major public health problem that we're sitting on here. So we, we did a bit of a survey in Bristol. We took 11 patients, we screened them, um, and then they had an alcohol detox, and then they went through treatment as usual, a whole bunch of different things, AA, rehab, therapies, etc. We followed them up at three, six, and nine months, and at nine months, there you go, eight of them are back to full dose alcohol use that they were before they started, and three of them are dry. So pretty much what we expected, this kind of 75% have relapsed completely. And that was just what we call an observational study, a treatment as usual study, to see what's, what's our current rate of treating this disorder. Um, this is not good enough. Now, psychiatry has become a bit, of a, a bit of a lonely place to work. We have become learned helpless as psychiatrists. We've given up. We like palliative care doctors. You know, if, you, if you're a patient coming in to see your psychiatrist in your, in your mid-twenties, having had a, se a severe history of child abuse and maltreatment, and you're presenting with PTSD or severe anxiety disorder or, effect or affective disorders or addictions, personality disorders, there's a pretty good chance you will still be talking to that psychiatrist when you're 60. Because we don't cure them, we get alongside them and care for them. It's not good enough. Why can't we be like other branches of medicine? Why can't we be like the orthopaedic surgeons? Why can't we mend that broken ankle, discharge them, and then never darken our doors again? Why can't we do that? And we've, if you say that to most psychiatrists, they'll laugh at you. They'll think that's, that's fanciful. I don't see why we can't treat, cure, discharge our patients and never see them again, even with severe mental disorders. And the reason we're not doing this is we lack an antibiotic to kill that bug. We're treating temperatures and we're not using something that's going to tackle that trauma. If only we had an antibiotic. You can see where this is going. So 3 4 methyl dioxide methamphetamine Quite a remarkable molecule. Um, if you were going to invent a molecule 
to treat trauma, you would come up with MDMA. Um, and so we thought, can we use MDMA to treat alcoholism? Now, you probably know, um, as you're probably well read in psychedelics, that the history of psychedelics are very much tied up with addictions. And in fact, most of the work with LSD in the 50s and early 60s was with alcoholism. And since then, we've, we've got um, studies with psilocybin and alcohol, we've got psilocybin and nicotine addiction, we've got ayahuasca and cocaine and nicotine and opiate addiction, we've had ketamine psychotherapy with um, opiate addiction and cocaine and alcohol addiction. Now, all of, these, um, all of these treatments with what I would call the classic psychedelics, LSD and psilocybin, what they all found in common, whether the ones back in the 50s and 60s, all the contemporary studies with psilocybin, for treating addictions was the strength of the psychospiritual experience, yeah? So using LSD and psilocybin, blow their mind, break open their head, create a mini organic psychosis, scare the willies out of them, and then it seems to result in a natural sobriety. And the, the greater the psychospiritual experience, the greater the abstinence from the, the whatever compound it is you're working with, whichever addictive compound. Now, Bill Wilson knew this, actually. Bill Wilson, the founder of AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, he had six very important psychedelic experiences with LSD um, in the late 50s, early 60s, whilst he was working on AA and developing the 12 steps. And the concept, I don't know how much you know about AA and the 12 steps, but there's a concept in that called the higher power. And this has been somewhat stolen and turned into a kind of Christocentric idea of a, of, of a religious god. When Bill Wilson wrote that, he was referring to the experiences under LSD. And not that many people in AA will tell you that, but it's based on LSD psychotherapy. Now, MDMA doesn't typically produce a psychospiritual experience. About 5 to 10% of people on their first threshold dose MDMA experience will report a communing with God and oceanic boundlessness and these kinds of psychospiritual experiences. But nothing like the 80 to 90% that you see with a classic psychedelic like LSD and psilocybin. So we thought, well, it might not work because it seems to be that psychospiritual experience that's so important for sobriety. But we do know that MDMA works very well with trauma. And if you've been following the work of MAPS in the States and the development of MDMA as a tool for post-traumatic stress disorder, you'd know that MDMA is very linked with trauma. And so we know that there's high levels of trauma in our addiction patients. So we kind of put two and two together and came up with five and said, let's see if MDMA psychotherapy works to treat an addiction. And it's never been done before, so it's the first one in the world. So MDMA, perfect tool for trauma-focused psychotherapy. It's short-acting, about two to five, two to four, five hours. It's not nearly as perceptually disturbing as LSD and psilocybin, very mild effects in terms of perceptions. Um, a little, you know, definitely improvement in terms of audible perceptions. It makes psytrance tolerable. <laughs> and, um, but it's, we're not talking melting walls and morphing faces and the kind of stuff you might get with a classic psychedelic. Um, almost always pleasurable. That's a really, really important factor when you're designing a drug for clinical deliverability. It's got to be tolerated by patients. A lot of patients who can't tolerate a classic psychedelic, can't even tolerate the idea of a classic psychedelic. You know, there's a reason why MDMA is so popular, much more popular than mushrooms and LSD, is because it is so tolerable. Almost always pleasurable. That's very important in a drug. The only other class of psychopharmacological drugs that are almost invariably pleasurable would perhaps be the opiates. And when I'm lecturing medical students, I say to them, if you don't love heroin, you don't have a brain. If you take heroin and find it a very unpleasant experience, you really need to go and talk to a neurologist because there's something wrong with your brain. So we're hardwired to find certain drugs pleasurable, and MDMA is one of them. So that's a very useful clinical tool. Safe. Now, I've been talking about MDMA for 15 years, and I used to put up graphs and tables about holes in the brain and neurotoxicity and ravers, and I just don't bother now. Because I think when I was doing that, I was kind of trying to convince myself or trying to convince my audience, it is very, very safe. Now, if you want data, I can give you data, but it is very, very safe. We're talking 750,000 doses of MDMA 
every weekend in this country for the last 25 years. Three quarters of a million doses of MDMA are consumed every weekend for a quarter of a century, and the rates of morbidity and mortality are staggeringly low. Staggeringly low. Once you take other drugs into effect and account, and you make sure it is MDMA, because there's a lot of deaths that are reported as ecstasy that are not MDMA, once you take all that into account, we're talking maybe five deaths a year in the UK. Now, you can bet your life that every single one of those deaths gets on the front page of the sun, leaving this perception that MDMA is a dangerous drug. It just isn't. When you look at the epidemiology of use, it's a staggeringly safe drug. As David Nutt said, safer than horse riding. Um, by a factor of 350. Yeah? <laughs> you look at the rates of uh, head injury, cognitive impairment, death, time off work, disability, um, 350 times more dangerous to ride a horse. I guess if you rode a horse on ecstasy, that might be. <laughs> so, very safe. And it's this, this remarkable ability to access these painful traumatic memories and enhance empathy. Now, what sort of a drug is it? Now, as you probably know, most of the psychedelics can be put into these two groups, the phenethylamines and the tryptamines, um, which leads some scholars to suggest that uh, both, both phenet phenethylamine and tryptamine are both endogenous chemicals within the brain, which does lead some scholars to suggest there could be endogenous psychedelic compounds, and people talk about DMT, and they talk about pineal gland, which is completely rubbish, just putting it here. No evidence for that yet. Um, very much propagated by Rick Strassen's book, but there's no evidence for that yet. Poor old pineal gland that's been diced and spliced and electrophoresed and PM'd, and no one's found any DMT yet. So um, it's tiny, it's like six to eight millimeters big. You know, threshold dose of DMT is about 17 milligrams. There's no way it's going to make enough DMT in that gland to have a threshold effect. So if there is an endogenous DMT in the body, it's almost certainly not made in the brain. It's certainly made, if it's going to be made anywhere, in the gut or in the lungs, where there's much higher concentrations of uh, serotonin. So MDMA is a phenethylamine. There it is. Um, no, another way of perhaps classifying psychedelic drugs would be um, their receptor actions or their effects and how they feel. So we talk about the classics being these big four, LSD, psilocybin, and DMT and mescaline. MDMA sits in this entactogens group alongside MDA and um, other phenethylamines, uh, psychedelic amphetamines, 2C series as well. So that's where they are. Now, this is a really important slide. When, when most people think about how does MDMA work, they'll just say, oh, it increases serotonin. Right? It's a bit more sophisticated than that. Firstly, it doesn't increase serotonin at all. It facilitates the actions of serotonin by increasing the output of serotonin at the synapse. Um, so we got action at the 5A1B, 1A and 1B. This is the kind of positively felt mood, the ecstasy effect, if you like, the euphoria, this reduction in depression and anxiety. This is really, really important because a patient will say to me in the MDMA state, oh man, is this, this feels so nice, it feels so lovely. Is this what love feels like? And I'll say, yeah, it kind of is, really. Serene, peaceful, at, at, at peace with yourself, not fearful. And of course, a cynic would say, this isn't love, this is a drug-induced, transient experience. And of course, it's a drug-induced, transient experience. But if you've never felt that, if all you've known since you were that high is fear and pain and exclusion, then it's a very, very valuable experience to induce that, even transiently in a patient because this can then become a platform for which they can build on and they know what this feels like, so it's important. We got it actually at the 2A receptors, which is where the classics, LSD and psilocybin work. But as I said, not to the same extent with all these uh, ego dissolution and ego loss experiences or per severe perceptual distortions, but just enough to give you a different way of looking at things, to help you think outside the box and see old problems with new eyes. Then we've got this weird paradoxical effect going on. Um, via the amphetamine part of the molecule, you have stimulation. There. This is dopamine and noradrenaline effect. Increased alertness, increased arousal. This is good. This motivates the patient to engage in therapy. And we have a paradoxical relaxation at the same time. 
by the alpha-1 and 2 receptors. And that's really weird. <coughs> and any of you who might have taken um, a drug such as ecstasy, which is uh, supposed to be MDMA, you will be familiar with that unusual feeling of being both speeded up and slowed down at the same time. It's quite unusual. And that puts you in the optimal arousal zone for psychotherapy. You're speeded up to motivate and engage in therapy. You're slowed down enough to take the edge off that hypervigilance that normally goes with painful trauma recall. And then we've got a uh, hormonal effect with the release of oxytocin. Now, oxytocin is the hormone secreted from the hypothalamus of breastfeeding mothers. It's a drug that engenders a sense of connectivity and bonding and attachment. And what's it doing to the brain? Well, there's our, there's our traumatized brain with its hyper amygdala effect, finding everything frightening, its shrunken prefrontal response, inability to see the good in things. On MDMA, we see a complete reversal of that. We see the amygdala switched off. Things that people would normally find frightening are no longer scary. And we see a boosting of the prefrontal lobe. We see a boosting of pro-social feelings, the ability to see the good in things. And this is a study that we did some years ago in, um, at Imperial with fMRI um, and healthy controls on MDMA. Now, when you add all of these things together, this is my favorite phrase at the moment to describe the effects of MDMA. It selectively inhibits the fear response whilst leaving the other faculties intact. Very important. Now, there's a lot of drugs that inhibit the fear response. A bottle of vodka will inhibit your fear response. A bag of heroin will very effectively inhibit your fear response, which is why these drugs are the, sort of the two biggest chosen drugs for people with trauma. But they're very messy drugs. You can't remember stuff with a bottle of vodka. You will talk a lot and you might feel fearless, but you won't really know what you're talking about. You can't reflect and debate and recall stuff, and you certainly won't remember the next day. It's, this, it's the incredible selectivity of MDMA to just take away fear, but leave the other faculties intact that's quite remarkable. And one of the things I ask my patients the day after MDMA, and hopefully the film is going to work and I can show you a patient, and he's consented for me to do this. Um, one of the things I ask them the next day is, um, you know, you talked loads yesterday. Do you even remember what you were talking about? Was it just all gobbledygook? Were you just high? And they always say, no, not at all. I remember every word of it, crystal clear. I just found I could do it. So patients who for 20 or 30 years have carried around in their head this inability to talk about pain and trauma can do it. You know, by the time I meet a patient in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, with an addiction or with PTSD, they become absolute experts at not talking about that night when they were eight years old and their grandfather came into their bedroom. They become an expert at avoiding that issue. They'll drink, they'll become heroin addicted, they'll self-harm, they'll attempt suicide, they'll be in and out of hospital, but they will not talk about that event. So when they sit down with their typical psychotherapist and the psychotherapist says, tell me about your rape, they're out the door. On MDMA, they can do it. I think of MDMA as like a sort of life vest or bulletproof vest to wear to go into battle with your trauma. It, you know, these patients are not in ecstasy, they're not euphoric, it's still difficult, painful, trauma-focused psychotherapy, but they can just about do it with the MDMA on board because the fear, the amygdala is switched off. And I will share an anecdote with you. So there's me, 18 years old in 1990, at a rave after a rave, lying around with all my friends, everyone all loved that, and someone says like, oh man, so beautiful, so beautiful. Um, let's try and think of the worst thing in the world. It's all lying there, they go, oh, let's imagine our mum's dying. Okay, it's not that bad. And that's really interesting, because this is long before I went to medical school, and long before I knew anything about MDMA psychotherapy. But that's kind of what we do with MDMA psychotherapy. You induce this mental state where you can talk about something that normally would be avoidant and fearful, but you can do it on MDMA. So we have just this week, ah, which reminds me, I have to ring the patient. We have just this week finished our final MDMA session on the Bristol Imperial MDMA for Alcoholism study. This is an open label safety and tolerability study. So there is no control group. There is no placebo. They all get MDMA. 
um, which you may think is pretty methodologically unsound, but that's what you have to do when you do um, first ever study with a new condition and a new drug. So you start with a safety and tolerability study in which everyone gets the drug without placebo. And we have 14 patients who've completed the study. They have an eight week course of psychotherapy and they take MDMA twice, sandwiched between non-drug sessions. And that's a pretty typical regime for most psychedelic therapies. Uh, they take 125 milligrams and then a half that dose two hours later, and they do that twice on weeks three and six. Um, there's a bit of a breakdown. Um, now what you can see here, the treatment as usual study, the observational study we did a year and a half before this study, um, we did the detox and the, the screening and the detox, then we didn't do the eight week session in between, but we did three, six and nine month follow up. So that previous study was a kind of a glimpse of what's happening without the eight week. <laughs> um, um, so what we've got, eight week psychotherapy course. Most of the sessions are outpatient, face-to-face um, -face therapy sessions, one hour, um, and they go home after each of those. On two occasions, weeks three and six, um, sessions three and seven, they have a full day with the MUMA and they stay overnight in the clinic. Then we follow them up for three, six, and nine months. Now. Um, I've mentioned this, the safety profile of MDMA. What's really important when talking about the safety profile of MDMA is we cannot make inferences about MDMA based on ecstasy users, whatever they are. I mean, what is ecstasy? It's like whatever someone told you it is. It may contain anywhere between zero and 350 milligrams of MDMA. So looking at the epidemiology of ecstasy users and ravers is not a good way of looking at clinical MDMA. And it's a real pain that people don't get this. I did an interview about 10 years ago for a newspaper in which uh, uh, the, I did, the, the journalist was quite good and he wrote this stuff about MDMA psychotherapy and, then, and he was quite balanced and then it came out and it said, British doctor says give kids ecstasy. And they ran the, pay, the piece alongside an interview with some parents whose child sadly died in a nightclub after taking 15 ecstasy tablets. And they were saying, this evil Dr. Sesson. And I ran up the editor and I said, what, what on earth are you doing? At what point did I say take 15 ecstasy tablets in a nightclub? And he said, oh, well, sir, we needed a balance. <laughs> and I said, that is not a balance. I said, find me the parents of a kid who died taking clinical MDMA in a clinical setting and you've got yourself a balance, but you won't find any. Because in 20 years of MDMA research, there have been no adverse, severe adverse reactions. Not one. No deaths. Nothing. It's a remarkably safe drug. But, so let's not talk about labors. Let's not, I would like to do a, a lecture where I don't even mention the E word. I mean, so you're probably familiar with this David Nutt's delta analysis of drug harms, took 20 drugs, ranked them with expert users, uh, police, politicians, pharmacists, parents, doctors, uh, coroners, judges, all sorts of different people, got them to make a judgment on the relative risks of these particular drugs through a whole load of different measures, um, and then ranked them. And he was doing this to demonstrate how the Misuse of Drugs Act doesn't <coughs> work, because if the Misuse of Drugs Act, with its, with its categories A, B, C, D, were correct, then it, all the top ones should be A, then B, then C, then D. But they're not like that at all. And there's alcohol at the top, and there's the uh, there's uh, MDMA, and there's the magic mushrooms languishing down the bottom there. Remarkably safe drugs. This is science. This is good, good science. This, on the other hand, the Misuse of Drugs Act, is pseudoscience. There is more scientific validity for crystal healing than there is that the Misuse of Drugs Act reduces the harms of drugs. If you learn nothing tonight, please go to your MP and ask for an urgent review of the Misuse of Drugs Act. It is killing young people. It is unpleasable, it is unscientific, it is illogical, it is stigmatizing, and it doesn't reduce the harms, the deaths, the crime, or even, weirdly, the usage of drugs. Yet it persists, which is a whole lecture in itself. 
and we are rapidly becoming one of the worst countries in the world in the way we manage drug problems. It's embarrassing. So I've got a few pictures of uh, our team. There we are, that was many years ago when we first started, back in 2015. Um, this chap here is Michael Mithoffer sitting down front. He was an MDMA psychotherapist in the States. <coughs> and some qualitative statements from people. Um, yeah, it's a safety and tolerability study primarily. So it's kind of about how patients tolerate it. Because there isn't a control group and there isn't a placebo, we can't really make a scientific inference about the efficacy. We can only really talk about the safety and tolerability. We can certainly look at outcomes in terms of drinking behavior, but we can't say whether it's the MDMA or just the wonderful therapists. Um, MDMA therapy has changed my life. One of the things we found, which is quite interesting, going back to what I said about the lack of psychospiritual experience, we're finding a lot of patients who are saying, who are describing its effects in clinical therapy like a classic. They're talking about seeing the light and losing themselves and rebranding themselves and reappraising these narratives. And we see that a lot, you know, I'm not useless, I'm not a failure, I'm a good person, it wasn't my fault. I don't have to keep torturing myself like this. I can achieve, I am worthy. We're hearing a lot of that. Um, we had a, we had a, a publication in um, June this year um, of the first four patients. We wanted to, I mean, it's, we, we're, we've only just finished dosing, so it's going to be another year till we get the papers out there. But we thought we would just get in there with a sort of taster, um, because it is the world's first study with MDMA for addictions. And the results were very positive in that case series. Um, now, the Ethics Committee asked us to do these ridiculous risk-averse things, like we have to measure their temperature and blood pressure every half hour for the first two hours, and then hourly thereafter. And you, you always get this really nice little curve of rises, and then sort of comes plateaus, and then comes down, all within normal physiological levels, no, no harm. Um, here's an interesting one. Blue Monday, Black Tuesday, Suicide Wednesday. Then on the this is one of the questions people ask a lot. What about the come down? What about feeling really low on day three or day four after MDMA? Now here we have a classic example of making inferences based on ravers. We don't see a come down. We don't see a black mood in the, perceived, in the, in the following week. In fact, we see an afterglow. People feel great. They don't come down. They don't have a come down. They just gently drift off and. Um, the, the experience drifts away and they have a good meal and they go to sleep and they feel great. You don't get that mood drop. So I'm really looking forward to writing the paper on that when we've got the data on all the patients, you know, called something like, I don't know, debunking the myth of Raver's Suicide Wednesday. It's just that you don't get it clinically. And so what the evidence suggests is this is an artifact of raving. I mean, look at the way people take ecstasy. <coughs> what do you do? You go to the pub, you drink three pints, you go to a club, you take a pill at midnight, you dance around, drink another few pints, have another pill at three o'clock, have another few pints, have another pill at four o'clock, go back to someone's house and do a line of speed, do a line of cocaine, smoke endless spliffs, drink a bottle of wine. <laughs> Maybe Sunday night you just about get about two hours sleep and a cup of soup. And then you go into work Monday or Tuesday and you feel low. And you go, and, and they go, oh man, it's ecstasy serotonin depletion. It's a bloody hangover. It's a hangover. When you take MDMA clinically, and you arrive at the clinic at 9 a.m., you take the medicine at 9.30, after having had a good night's sleep, you're up all day, you're back down to baseline by five or six in the evening, you have a nice meal, you sleep well, you feel great. So we cannot make inferences about MDMA based on ravers. They're a very heterogeneous group with all sorts of concomitant drug, drug use, but especially its lack of sleep and excessive exercise. So we don't see that. Um, we did a whole load of measures, uh, anxiety, depression, um, quality of life stuff, and you know, across the board, huge improvements over the course of the uh, therapy. Um, here's the sort of results so far. Now, pretty much up to date, because we've um, well, the very last patient has now completely finished, yeah. So, um, all of this half the table is 
spectacularly uninteresting, which is good, it's supposed to be. That's demonstrating the safety and tolerability. Nobody had bad experiences, everyone tolerated it, everyone floods and ECGs were normal, so that's great. We kind of ticked the box of the primary outcome, which is the safety and tolerability. Now if we look at the, drug, the drinking behavior, kind of interesting. Firstly, look at the relapse of alcohol use disorder. So, how many of the patients are actually returned to full levels of drinking that they were at before? And they were detoxed, yeah? So these were full-on daily dependent drinkers, heavy daily dependent drinkers. 16 pints a day, three bottles of wine, two bottles of vodka type a day. And, <coughs> and of those, 14, two have returned completely fallen off the wagon, yeah? Now, that's great. That's almost a total reversal of our treatment as usual study. Um, but this other column, the one just in from the right there, is kind of interesting. About half of the people who haven't returned to full drinking <coughs> have had a drink or two. That's really unusual in an addiction study. Most, of, most addictions therapy target total abstinence. You know, you've got this evil drug alcohol, and the AA approach is very like this. You must never touch alcohol again. You must fear alcohol for the rest of your life. You sit there in your AA group and you say, I'm an alcoholic, I haven't had a drink for 35 years. What this is suggesting, and the numbers are kind of too small to make too much of a conclusion, if it turns out that MDMA-assisted psychotherapy allows you to return to a moderate drinker, that would be a remarkable outcome for an addiction study. Because usually it's one or the other. Most people, when they relapse, having been a daily drinker, fall off the wagon completely. You don't just... You don't drink a bottle of vodka every day for 20 years, get clean, and then can have a glass of wine at a wedding every now and then. It just doesn't usually work like that. It's either all or nothing. So if this column can be replicated, it's a very interesting finding. And it was sort of fit with the whole change of personal narratives. They've actually made core changes inside around their relationship with alcohol. I think when we get to the end that everyone's at the nine-month point, I think the results are not going to be as spectacular as that. I think we're going to have 50-50. I think we're going to have 50% of people back to the drinking full-time, 50% dry. Now, that still is remarkable. That still has blown out of the water the current best treatments for alcoholism. So we have to just watch. Um, right, let's see if this is going to work. It's not really cool. This is a patient <coughs> just a couple of weeks ago, the next day after his MDMA. Um, so... They say overnight, so he's not high here. He's had, he slept in the clinic and we've come in and seen him at 9 a.m. the next day. Um, and this is a really important therapeutic session, really, because it's, the experience is still very much in his mind. Oh yeah, do you have speakers in this? Um, I don't know whether, oh no.
MDMA has been on post-traumatic stress disorder. There's been one study uh, looking at social anxiety disorder in, in, in adults with autism, but most of it's PTSD, which is why we wanted to branch away from that and see if it works with addictions. Most of the work with psilocybin in recent years has been around addictions or anxiety disorders, end-of-life anxiety disorder particularly. You know, psychedelics have this, especially classic psychedelics, have this capacity to answer or at least reflect upon these big existential issues. You know, who am I? What is... What is it to die? And so uh, really useful tools in end of life experiences. And then we got stuff with ibogaine and ketamine and ayahuasca and all sorts of stuff. And um, lots, of, uh, lots of studies done in recent years through Imperial. And uh, like they even said, I've, I've been a research subject being injected with intravenous LSD and psilocybin and DMT and ketamine. Um, and I've injected other patients. Um, <coughs> Well, healthy research subjects. Most of us at Imperial put ourselves forward as test subjects as well as study doctors. So uh, most of those brains that you see in those results have come out of Imperial staff. I think I hope we're you know, reflective of normal people. Um, lots of work that's been done recently. Now, I just, I just want to finish with this. So this is Michael Mithoffer and I. Um, he's a, a professor in the state, pioneer of psychedelic therapy, MDMA therapy. A lot, of, a lot of young people come to me and they say, Ben, I'm interested in psychedelics. I want to work as a psychedelic therapist. I want to write an essay about it. I want to get involved in psychedelic renaissance. And they say, but I, I talked to my tutor about this and they said, this is career suicide. You're crazy. 
Why are you aligning yourself with these terrible hippies? Now, that, this experience happened to me when I was here in Oxford 15 years ago. My tutor said, don't do this. You know, this is career suicide. You'll never work again. Why don't you study something nice and wholesome like SSRIs? <laughs> and it has not turned out to be career suicide at all. Not in the slightest. So if you have tutors who are saying this to you and people are trying to put you off, what you say to them is just open your journals, yeah? Because this is no longer some crazy fringe subject. This isn't just something that sort of crazy weirdos in California do. This is cutting edge neuroscience. And all of these major universities and institutions are now running psychedelic research programs. It's where we are in modern psychiatry today. And it's going to, su trust me, it's going to supersede the maintenance model of psychiatry. We are seeing a collapse of modern psychiatry. We've already got the opioid crisis and endless lawsuits in the States against all the pharma groups. What's coming next, in my opinion, are lawsuits about SSRIs. Disgruntled patients who've been parked on antidepressants for 30 years that don't work. It's collapsing, it's falling apart, and this is the perfect right ground for psychedelics. So, I urge you to get involved in any way you can. We owe it to our patients to do this. They've been failed by modern psychiatry. There is a better way, and we owe it particularly to that little girl. Thank you. So that's a good question, and it's a question I get asked a lot, you know, because it's quite depressing and fatalistic to imagine that you have these brain changes in infancy and they never change. Well, there is evidence that you can change it. You can change the personal narratives and you can change the connectivity within the brain through positive self-esteem boosting experiences and through psychotherapy. There's not nearly enough neuroimaging data that there ought to be, but you do change these, you do change the brains and you do change the narratives, but it's very difficult. I mean, like I said, I can't just shake my patients and tell them to think of the world in another way. They have to learn it. And this is the thing that MDMA psychotherapy or any psychotherapy or any medicines are not gonna just change the brain like that. It's a slow process. You know, it's taken 40 or 50 years with those fixed narratives to get where they are. It's not gonna change overnight. It changes through experience. It changes through patients engaging in positive activities and feeling worthy and being praised. But I would not be able to do my job if I thought that it's indelible. It's just very difficult to change the rigidity, but you can. really a pharmacology or medical question, that's a political or social question, isn't it? I mean, yeah, universal health care for all. Um, and these are, these are the things we need to do when we're setting up how we're going to use psychedelics. The psychedelic community is quite critical of a lot of the psychedelic pharmacology research because they see what's happening in the States, that 
it's something that's for the privileged few. Mm. And a lot of the psychedelic community even are against the medicalization of psychedelics because they see this, you know, don't, you know, keep your hands off our sacred medicines. Don't let pharma get them. Now, I don't, I don't buy into that, you know. I think that the current situation is the one that is exclusive. If you're a rich, trustafarian Westerner and you can pay five grand and go to Peru and take ayahuasca, you know, good for you. Or go to Top Ness and sit in someone's yurt for four grand and have magic mushrooms with them. It's an incredibly exclusive situation at the moment with a tiny number of people having psychedelic therapies. By medicalizing them, using, working with the pharma industry, developing these as licensed medicines, we open up psychedelics to everyone. You know, my patients are, I mean, one of the problems with the psychedelic community is it's, it pretends it's really right on and it, in, inclusive. It's very, it's very dogmatic itself, you know? You, you know, you've got to wear a tie-dye shirt and have dreads and listen to Indian sitar music and incense <laughs> and all that crap. You know, why? Why? You know, if I look at my patients in Western Supermare, these are hard, shaven-headed, tattooed, tracksuit-wearing people who, my God, do they need MDMA and psychedelics because they are broken people. But they would run a mile if I talked to them about energy levels and chakras, you know? We have to disengage from that pseudoscience. We have to medicalize psychedelics. We have to meet the patients where they are. You know, why a picture of Buddha on the wall? Why not? Taylor Swift or Man United or a Lamborghini, you know? If these are the power objects that our patients bring to us, we need to be meeting them. So, getting back to your question, it's about inclusivity and accessibility. And the first thing we need to do is get the drugs licensed and approved as medicines and then rolled out. And the project we're trying to set up at the moment, based in Bristol but spread across the whole of the world, is opening a whole series of psychedelic clinics which will be available on the NHS. So that is the plan. Yeah, do you want to just shout it? Oh, oh there you go. Yeah. Um, what's it like sitting through as the therapist in a, in a six to eight hour long session? Like, what was the experience for you in that? I imagine it is one therapist doing the whole session. It's two therapists, myself and Laurie as the co-therapist. We have a male, female pair. What's it like? It's, um, it's fascinating mm. and it's enthralling mm -hmm. and it's deeply privileged experience because, you know, I've been doing psychotherapy for 15 years and you are aware of the blocks that prevent you moving forward in psychotherapy. And so seeing patients say things like, I've never talked about this before, I've carried this around in my head for 20 years, and, to and today I can talk about it in great detail. You know, like I said, usually they, they wouldn't even be able to talk about the idea of talking about their rape or their trauma. And in the MDMA state, they talk about it and they remember it. They're not just disinhibited, it's far more sophisticated than that. They're making real changes in their narratives and the way they see things. So it's really fascinating. And, and is it all talking? Or are there no, more that's a good question. Stuff, or it's not all talking. We, the patient spends a lot of time, what we call going inside. They lie on a bed, they have eye shades on and headphones, and they, they can spend hours like that with the drug. Um, sounds a bit hippie-ish, but like <laughs> the drug has an inner healing effect. This is even more hippie-ish. The drug sort of knows what to do. It really does, and they, they come to the, the reason we have the preparation sessions is because they build up an agenda, and, and we use that agenda loosely, but it's very client-led. You know, it's not like CBT, it's not like, right, turn to page six, we're going to do exercise 4B. You know, they, they, the patients are high, they're not really able to do that, nor would it work. So it's very led. We might nudge them gently, we might say, do you remember last week we were talking about your brother? This might be a good time to go inside and see where that takes you. So they might spend an hour or so like that, then they'll take off the eye shades and they'll sit up, they'll talk for a bit, and then they'll go back inside. So it's kind of in and out like that. But we really encourage them to spend as much time as possible alone with medicine, because they've got plenty of other time to talk. Um, at the back, and then I'll bring you a mic. 
I was wondering, is MDMA psychotherapy less effective on some of these already frequent MDMA users, like recreational? Um, no, no, we haven't found that. We, um, I'm trying to remember what our inclusion and exclusion criteria are. We've, we, we're not specifying whether you've had MDMA or not. We, I think we rule out people who've had more than six doses of MD, no, any, any dose within the last six months and more than 20 lifetime doses, we're ruling them out. Mainly because we don't want people just doing the study to sort of blag some free, you know, <laughs> good. But um, we haven't found that. But what's really interesting, because I, as part of my training, I underwent MDMA psychotherapy in a clinical setting with therapists. Um, and that's one of the formal parts of MDMA training. And I've taken ecstasy before. And what's the thing about recreational ecstasy, it's all about the externalizing behavior, isn't it? It's, it's all music, lasers, banging sound systems, dancing, drinking, taking other drugs, having sex, party, party, party. Whereas when you take MDMA psychotherapy in a clinical setting, you're lying still in the dark with headphones on. You're not moving, you're not dancing. It, and having done both, it just didn't feel like my ecstasy experiences. So I don't think it matters that you've had ecstasy experiences because it really won't feel like that. And this is a really interesting point. If you look at the way people take classic psychedelics like LSD and psilocybin recreationally, that's pretty close to the way we use them therapeutically. You know, if you take, I mean, you can go to a big banging party on LSD, but normally you wouldn't. Normally, when people take mushrooms or LSD, it's like, you know, three or four people sitting around a candle in a darkened room listening to Pink Floyd. It's quite <laughs> soporifically quiet, like, like we do in the therapy. Imagine a rave with 5,000 people on ecstasy lying still in the dark. You know, that's getting closer. So it's weird that, this is why it has, so it's a good question. It's, it's, it does have a much more transformative effect, which makes me wonder whether that statistic of only about five to 10% of people on first threshold dose MDMA reporting psych spiritual experiences compared to the 80 to 90 on classics, if more people took MDMA in the same way they take LSD, we would probably get a much higher report of psychospiritual experiences. Is it true that there's a certain risk to taking taking SSRIs alongside MDMA? Um, it's not so much a risk, it's, it, it attenuates MDMA. So we wean all of our patients off SSRIs because you just don't get a good experience. Um, I mean, there's even some people who think taking SSRIs and MDMA boosts the MDMA, it really doesn't. When you see people walking around the rave just looking a bit anxious and chewing their face off, they're probably on antidepressants. So, yeah, you've got to wean yourself off SSRIs. They reduce the effect. I mean, you can get effects like serotonin syndrome, but that's pretty rare. The main reason we get them off is because it, the MDMA doesn't work very well. Um, hello. Hi. How, overall, how your experience as a psychic illness differs between uh, men and women, if at all? Um, with MDMA? Yeah. Um, I mean, we've only we've dosed 14 patients, and they're about 50-50 men and women. It's hard, it's not, I can't really say that there's a particular gender difference, because they've all got a whole different range of trauma histories and experiences. So, um, we haven't noticed a particular gender difference. I mean, when we look back at the data, which we're going to have to start doing at some point, we may see some clear gender differences, but uh, nothing that stands out. I'm interested because um, you're talking about people that have been through abuse and trauma, going, you know, having therapy, and then uh, then being able to you know, see it from a different perspective, and you get that, like, uh, being able to you know, look at your emotions more object objectively. I was thinking from the other end of the spectrum, so, like, people that have been abusers or criminals that maybe haven't empathised in because uh, in sessions where they you know talk to psychiatrists about what they've done do you see a possibility of doing the same thing you're doing with mdma and maybe seeing if they can it can have an effect to you know, have them empathize with their victims and look at mm. their 
Great, great question, and very pertinent question, because I had someone come and visit me last week, I think they were from the Maudsley, wishing to do a study with uh, people on probation with antisocial personality disorder. Um, and I'm going to be working with her to design a protocol using MDMA assisted psychotherapy for antisocial personality disorder for that exact mm -hmm. reason. You know, MDMA's capacity to increase empathy, um, which is one of the core um, features absent in people with antisocial personality disorder. Um, and which is the other reason why there's this, been, this study done on patients with adults with autism. You know, one of the core features of autism is this kind of lack of empathy, this inability to put yourself in someone else's shoes and see things from their perspective. Um, and a similar thing with lack of remorse and lack of empathy with antisocial personality disorder. So you're absolutely spot on. There could well be a use there. I mean, I think it would certainly occur within the session. I think you would get patients saying, oh God, right. I feel really bad about what I did to that guy in that pub. You know, I wish I hadn't beaten him up. Whether it generalizes and they make lasting narrative changes, I don't know. But it would that's be a, a question, isn't it? Yeah, it, it, I don't know. But again, like, like alcohol use disorder, that's a very, very difficult population to treat. And the current treatments are not that good. So it's definitely worth targeting with MDMA assisted psychotherapy. So 15, 10 years ago, the, the pharmacology community was sort of split in a 50-50 neurotoxicity safety argument. We are now at a sort of 97-3 position. Very, very few pharmacologists these days accept the neurotoxicity argument with MDMA. And that's really because we've had 25 years of data. MDMA is not on the radar as a public health concern. We do not see patients in addiction services with ecstasy addiction, ecstasy abuse. We do not see patients filling our wards and clinics with dementias and depressions based on ecstasy. It just doesn't happen, despite the massive heavy use. It's just, so the epidemic of brain damage that, that was suggested might happen 20 years ago just hasn't happened, despite very heavy ecstasy use. So um, that's the epidemiological answer. Now, when it comes to MDMA psychotherapy, you know, we're talking about two doses, two doses. There's no question whatsoever that that's going to cause any lasting neurological damage. And, and we do batteries, uh, actually we didn't do them in this study, but a lot of the other studies have done batteries of cognitive testing and nothing at all, no, no cognitive impairments at all. But I guess one way of looking at it is all medicine is risk versus benefit. There is no 100% safe treatment. Every single treatment has risks, from cancer chemotherapy <coughs> to a sticking plaster. And as a doctor, when you have a patient before you, you make a risk-benefit analysis when you decide whether or not it's beneficial for the patient. And if the benefits outweigh the risks, you use it. So a sticking plaster, risks pretty low, um, hurts when you pull it off. Benefits pretty good, stops venous blood flow, allows the wound to stay clean. So that's pretty, it's a no-brain. Cancer chemotherapy, risk's really high, but if you don't use it, they might die, so you make that decision. MDMA, you know, 20, 30 years of alcoholism, PTSD, repeated overdoses, repeated hanging attempts, addictions. Can we justify two doses of MDMA in this patient that might turn that terrible situation around? So I guess what I'm saying here is even if it did have some toxicity and there's no evidence it does, that still wouldn't mean it's not a beneficial treatment because it's weighed up against not using it. So I can't direct you towards any specific papers, but there are a great many. Um, there's whole books about it, about how it's not a concern. Things like looking at people who've been heavy users and within a year of abstinence, they have no neurocognitive deficits. So yeah, it's, it's not a problem. That's great news. Thank you. What, why? What have you got planned? Yeah. Yeah. Therapy. It's great news for therapy yeah. in the field. Uh, hi. Um, uh, you, you mentioned 
Titans. And, uh, and, I, and I, I remember, you know, Candy Flip was very popular in, in, a, in a Cytron scene. And, um, would, you, would you have um, anything to say about Candy Flip? Or, about which? Or, or Candy Flip by uh, taking uh, LSD and... Uh, oh, Candy uh, Flip, right. Yeah, so and then uh, together, would you see any yeah. benefits on this? Okay, so good question. I mean, we are at the beginning of our work with psychedelics clinically. And so far, nobody's proposed a protocol that involves more than one psychedelic, either at the same time or even at different points. Like, you know, MDMA one week and then three weeks off and then psilocybin and then two weeks later MDMA. I have no doubt that those kinds of <coughs> protocols will come eventually. Because from what we know from underground psychotherapies with psychedelics is you can use a whole range of different substances. You can use TCB and then MDMA and then LSD. So these are using it in different sessions, and obviously from recreational use, <coughs> take combination um, drugs at the same time. So the simple answer is no, there are no protocols as yet suggesting that, which is kind of understandable. It's hard enough getting just basic stuff through ethics committees, the idea of giving both. I, I, think, I think the next thing to come will be protocols where you do take different drugs, but not at the same time. But who knows in five, 10, 15 years, why not? If it's safe and it's efficacious, do it.